And we on? There we go. Happy Sabbath, church family. Oh, were you blessed by that worship? That was, that was awesome. Just what I needed this morning. So glad you are here. If this is your first time joining us ever at the sanctuary, we are so blessed to have you. Um, as people will continue to come in, we are in our series of forgiveness. Um, and this is always a tough series when you're a pastor to preach because as you're writing your sermons, you feel God like move on your heart and you're like, no, I don't want to forgive that person. <laughs> he, he convicts your own heart as you're in the midst of writing a sermon about bringing everyone else to conviction. <laughs> forgiveness is a hard topic. And I feel that there's a bit of misunderstanding about forgiveness. This is what I want to talk about this morning is that when we talk about forgiveness, I feel as though there is this notion that forgiveness is either for the weak or it is for the incredibly holy. Like you are one of two things. You are either a doormat for the person who hurt you and caused pain in your life and you allow them to walk all over you, or you are this pious and holy person equal to that of Mother Teresa or Gandhi. I remember hearing this phrase growing up in church. You must forgive because Jesus forgave. To which I always felt like replying. I was a bit of a sarcastic kid growing up and I still am a little bit. To which I always feel like replying, I don't know last time you looked, I'm not Jesus. So I think I'm going to go on not forgiving. There is this sort of belief about forgiveness. That when you have to forgive, you are either weak or you are either incredibly holy and is looked on as this sort of unreal, unrealistic goal that only Jesus could do. Only those that they write books about can forgive. But church family, what I want to share with you this morning, what God has revealed to me through this study, is that forgiveness is not weakness, but forgiveness is power. Forgiveness is power. Forgiveness is a portal through which we access the power of God. And that power is made manifest through us when we forgive. Amen? Forgiveness is not just reserved for the holy, the select few. But forgiveness is the essence of what Jesus came to bring about. Forgiveness is giving someone what Jesus has given to you. When you give forgiveness, and all people can forgive, it's giving someone the gospel. It's giving someone good news. Amen? This morning, I want to talk about a, um, one of my favorite stories in the gospel, um, a story out of Matthew 18. Jesus is in the midst of painting a picture for his disciples of what his new heaven community will look like. So in this passage in Matthew 18, he talks about that you must be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. He talks about, one of my favorites is that those that we label lost are in reality in this community, in this kingdom. Those are the ones who are found. And he's just in, in, in doing this teaching about when a brother or a sister wrongs you, how you deal effectively with that. And then he goes into this teaching on forgiveness. And I think this is so important because this is one of Jesus' main teachings. And what that means about forgiveness is that when we forgive, forgiveness is not just a manifestation of believing in God, but it is part of that belief in God. Are you with me? It is the essence of this kingdom, of this community. This is a faith community that Jesus is saying, this is what it looks like when heaven crashes into earth. This, this is a community that is characterized, that is permeated with forgiveness. Matthew 18, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open there, or your iPhones or your iPads, whatever you may have. Matthew 18, and we're going to start on um, verse 21. If not, we can just read it right there on the screen. Then Peter came up and said to him, this is Peter talking to Jesus, Matthew 18, verse 21, then Peter came up and said to him, and I just want to stop right there, because of course Peter came up and said to him. Peter is the one who is always asking questions in the gospel, isn't he? 
Peter is the guy, did you ever have that kid in class where your teacher is teaching something and none of you have the guts to be like, I don't understand this. But then there's that one kid who's like, I'm not getting this. And everyone else is like, thank you. You are amazing. Peter is that guy who speaks before he thinks. Perhaps some of us know some people like that. And Peter comes up to Jesus and he asks him a question. And I love this because Peter is so perfect for this group of disciples. Because the disciples so often didn't get what Jesus said. They did not get the message that Jesus would preach. So often, the way I picture it in the Gospels is that Jesus would be preaching. And so often when we think of these disciples, we think of them as sort of like intellectual scholars. Like, oh yeah, Jesus, that's deep. That's moving. Let me write that down on my tablet of stone. <laughs> I picture these disciples, when Jesus is preaching, not as scholars, but his bodyguards. That's who, I just, that's who I picture these disciples as. These guys were, perhaps some of them were disciples before, but most of them were just dirty dudes. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. And so as Jesus is preaching their disciple, I imagine it in my mind like this. Like they're just, they're standing around like, you know, like a bouncer at a concert. Those guys that you can never get to smile, no matter how hard you try. They're just standing there stony-faced. And Jesus is preaching, and they're like, yeah. Yeah, that's right. you got to sell everything. That's my homie Jesus right there. Where's your rabbi at? That's my rabbi. What you know about that? you got to pick up your cross and follow. You're going to follow what you're going to do. What you going to do? And, and they sort of like be sort of bodyguards, these bouncers for Jesus. And what I love in the, in the Gospels is this, is that when the crowds would leave, the disciples would pull this thing. Um, Jesus, I didn't really get what you said back there. <laughs> They'd wait till everybody else would disperse so they wouldn't be embarrassed. And it would inevitably be Peter. Um, Jesus, you just said that your body was bread and your blood was wine. If you're looking for disciples, that's probably not the way to go about it. I didn't really get that. So often the disciples just miss what Jesus says, but praise the Lord that that is then and not now. Right, church family? Because we never miss the words of Jesus. We never misunderstand what Jesus said. That was just then. And so Peter, Peter comes up and he asks Jesus a question. And he says these words, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. How many of you have heard a sermon on this? And the pastor just dogs on Peter like he is so cocky and he is arrogant. I don't know how much of that is going on here. Here's what I think is going on. I think Peter knows that Jesus is a different type of disciple, or excuse me, rabbi. I think that he knows he's not just this ordinary rabbi, but there's something special about who this Jesus is. And in the Bible, seven is a very biblical number. Seventh day, Sabbath. Seven is a number for perfection, for completion. And in my mind, the typical rabbinic teaching at that time was that you had to forgive someone three times. After three, they're gone. Someone dents your car three times, I forgive you. On the fourth time, dude, we're done. I don't even know you anymore. Peace. So Peter comes up to Jesus seven times. How many times must I forgive? Jesus is a different kind of rabbi. He's not ordinary. His teachings are revolutionary. And Peter comes up and he says, Lord, how many times should I forgive? Seven times. In my mind, I don't imagine Peter being super conceited or arrogant or anything. I imagine Peter as raising the standard. Jesus has raised the standard on every other thing, and, and Peter's sort of getting that. This is towards the end of the book of Matthew, and he says, well, we've been taught three, but perhaps it's seven in my mind, Peter is raising the bar. He's raising the standard. And look what Jesus says to him. I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Some translations say 77 times. Essentially what Jesus says here, there is no limit to forgiveness in my kingdom. There is no cap. There is no max. There is no keeping track when you forgive. You forgive and you forgive and you forgive. This is a kingdom of a different nature, of a different type. 
Peter comes to Jesus and he raises the standard. Let's go from three to seven, but what Jesus is about. Jesus is not about raising the standard, but about bringing about, but about creating an entirely new system. Not about just raising the standard, but a brand new system. How many of you own an Apple product in here? Raise your hands. Any Apple? Any? Okay, very, very popular. Do you remember the first moment that you opened your Apple product? Weren't there angels singing on high? It is, it is such a holy and sacred moment when you get this Apple product and the box is just gorgeous. I remember when my, my wife bought her MacBook Air and we, we set it there on the table and it was just so gorgeous. I literally washed my hands before I opened the package <laughs> because I didn't want to like get fingerprints or smudges on anything. And the fascinating thing about an Apple product is, yeah, their computers, their iPads, their iPhones, they're gorgeous. But what's amazing is that you open this box and you can literally look at the power cord for like 30 minutes. It's so beautiful. It's like, oh my goodness. You're white and you're smooth and you're perfectly rounded in every way. Every part of an Apple product, it's about this experience. And the thing that Steve Jobs did that's so revolutionary is he didn't see a, a, a computer, a PC, and he says, well, I'm just going to raise the standard on that computer. Steve said, no, no, no. We're going to bring out a whole new way of doing things. It's not just about the computer, but it's about this whole system, a brand new system of integrated items where they all link seamlessly. And it's not just about the computer, but it's about the whole experience. It's about opening up this box that fits perfectly together. It's an amazing experience. Steve Jobs, when he created Apple products, he didn't just raise the standard, but he created an entirely new system. And Jesus, here in Matthew 18, isn't just raising the bar, but he's creating a whole new system. You don't have to keep count anymore. You don't have to hold on. There is nothing that you can't forgive. There is no limit, no max, no cap to what you can forgive. In my kingdom, in my community, you forgive and you forgive and you forgive. Amen? No more keeping track. This is an entirely new way of being. And then Jesus goes into this parable. And what I love about a parable is this. Did you know that a parable literally means to hide? Did you guys know that? Jesus' teachings were so revolutionary that he had to hide his teachings. There's this account earlier in, in, the, in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is preaching one of his first sermons. And how do people react to Jesus' first sermon? They pick up rocks and they try to kill him. That is what happens when Jesus preaches bluntly, when he doesn't try to disguise anything. Whenever I'm like with pastors, I'm like, how did your first sermon go? It's like, eh, it's all right. It's like, well, it's better than Jesus. At least I didn't try to kill you. <laughs> Jesus has to disguise these teachings in a parable. And the parable begins, Therefore the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servant. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. This is an extraordinary amount of money. We lose sight of how much money this is because it's in talents. But modern day, this is around six billion dollars. Six billion dollars. This man owes the king six billion dollars. What was he doing? Did he buy like 18 Lambos or something? <laughs> owes him six billion dollars. This is an amount of money, church family, that can never, ever be repaid. Ever. Not in his lifetime. He can never do something that will repay this six billion dollars. And it continues, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. Notice the man asks for forgiveness, be patient with me. But how does he ask it? I will pay you everything. Really? Ev everything? Last time I checked, you owed six billion dollars. You're going to repay everything? Notice this man's language. This man has no clue 
no sense of how large his debt is. No idea. It's not even entering his mind. These are just empty words. Please have patience with me. I will pay everything back. No, you won't. You can't pay everything back. The thing about forgiveness is this, is that when we forgive, at times, we wait for the other person to realize that what they've done is wrong, don't we? Don't you want that? You want the other person to come up to you and ask you for forgiveness. You don't want to forgive. And so we wait, and we wait, and we wait. But the reality is this. That person may never fully realize that what they did is wrong. They may never comprehend how much they hurt you. They may never realize how big that hurt is. And so forgiveness is not taking a step back, but it's taking a step forward. It's being the aggressor. It's having the power and saying, I forgive because you can forgive today. You don't have to be, you don't have to be a victim of that other person's response. You can forgive right now. The king says this, out of pity, the master forgave him and he released him from his debt. This man receives forgiveness. He's good to go. But the same servant went out. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Seizing him, he began to choke him. He began to choke him. Have you ever choked somebody over something that they owed you? Like this man has just been, has just been forgiven six billion dollars. And 100 denarii is, is a decent amount of money. It's like $12,000 right around there. It would have taken about five months to repay. But the thing about this amount of money in contrast to the first amount is that this can be repaid. This amount of money can be paid back. And yet this man is forgiven and he goes out and he seeks revenge. He chokes a man who owes him $12,000, something so much smaller than what he owed the king. And I know we all read this story and we're like, how could he do that? How could he choke a man? We don't physically choke people, but we mentally choke people, don't we? Don't we? You're on the freeway and that person cuts you off. What do you do? You pull up right beside him and you give him the death stare. <laughs> You'll never cut me off again. We can't physically choke people, but we want to. We can't strangle them with our fingers, but we strangle them with our minds. We give them the death stare. My wife is one of the most beautiful creatures to ever grace this planet. I have no idea how I got so lucky to be with her, but one day God will answer some of the biggest questions in life. Why do bad things happen to good people, and why did Garrett Spire end up with Cambria Hayton? Someday, someday, that will be answered. But when my wife and I started dating, my wife was going to school in heaven, otherwise known as Walla Walla. Beautiful, gorgeous potato fields. <laughs> and I was going to school at PUC at the time. My Cambria's, ex, Cambria's ex-boyfriend happened to be going to PUC with me. And so when he found out that we were dating, it was a little bit awkward. <laughs> This guy, I kid you know, so weird. He would just plant himself around every corner, like in PUC. I'd be walking around the corner, and there he was, posted up, giving me the death stare. You took my lady. I'm like, yeah, I did. It's awesome. And, and I, I would be like walking to the library at night, and these beady eyes would just be looking at me through the darkness. I'm like, it wasn't just him, but like all his friends. And I could tell he wanted to punch me so badly. Like, he wanted to fight me. He wanted to choke me, but he couldn't because he was a little man. <laughs> he was a very short man. And, and I loved it because I would sort of like, you know, coordinate our, our seeing one another. And I could tell he was just dying. I'm like, dude, your little hands won't even fit around my brawny neck. <laughs> All right? You can't do this. And so he'd give me the death stare. 
he would, he would give me the cerebral chokehold. This is what we do. This man is, is choking someone over, over a petty thing compared to what he has been forgiven. He's choking him, choking him. And look what happens. Saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and he pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Notice what this man says. Have patience with me and I will pay you. That's the exact same phrase that servant used with his master. But yet there's a completely different outcome. This man is thrown into prison. This man does not forgive. And he says this. He refused, and he went and put him in prison until he should pay his debt. How often in life do we fall before the throne of the king and we ask for grace and we say, God, I owe you more than I could ever pay you. And God grants us grace. God gives us mercy. God forgives us. And yet the very next moment we walk out the door and we demand justice from someone else. We withhold forgiveness from someone who has wronged us. We fall on the feet of the king. Forgive us, forgive us, forgive us. And not a week later, not a month later, not a year later, we walk out that door and we choke someone out for something way, way less than what we have done to God. We beg for grace, and yet we demand mercy. We demand justice. We demand that we, we, you must pay me what you owe. Forgiveness, church family, begins with understanding that you have been forgiven by God. This first man never understands the weight of his death never understands how much he owes, the fact that he could never pay this six billion dollars. No matter how hard he tried, he would always fall short. He would always come up short. How many times in your life have you tried to earn something, to do something, to pay a debt that you owe God? When God says, I'm giving you forgiveness, I'm giving you grace, I'm giving you mercy, because we when we fall at the feet of the king, we forget the sins that we were bearing. We forget the wrong that we had done. And we get up and we walk out that door don't, not believing that we have been fully forgiven. And so when we beg for forgiveness but we demand justice, what we truly want is justice. And God is never going to force his grace, never going to force his forgiveness upon us. If you want justice, you can have it. And the parable continues. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said this, You wicked servant, I forgave you the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow servant as I had had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay his debt. And then Jesus ends with this text. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Forgiveness, church family, is not a mental concept, but it begins with a relationship. It begins with knowing deep within your heart, deep within your soul, that you have been forgiven. When you know, when you accept, when you realize that no matter what you could have done, your debt could never be paid by you, but it must be paid by a Savior who died on a cross. When you accept that forgiveness, church family, the forgiven forgive. The forgiven forgive forgive. Not so that they are forgiven, but because they are forgiven. You don't have to try any more. It begins 
with accepting God's forgiveness in your own life and letting that forgiveness permeate out into every other dynamic of your life, letting people see Jesus through you because the end of the story, church family, is not just forgiveness, but it's transformation. Jesus is interested in a life changed, not just giving you a free pass, but bringing you closer to him. Jesus is reconciling all things, making all things new. And that includes you, and that also includes the person who has wronged you. All things new. Everything can be forgiven. You can be transformed. When you forgive, you give someone the gospel. You give someone the good news. You give someone forgiveness because that's what Jesus has given you, church family, the forgiven. Forgive. Amen? One more story. When I was... When I was at uh, PUC, I had one of the greatest experiences of my life. I was burnt out on church. I didn't want anything to do with God. And one of my buddies rescued me. He just said, hey, come get involved in this thing called Kids Reach. And every Sabbath, what we would do is we'd get up at like 5 in the morning. And we would hop down. We'd go down to Napa. And we'd get in this really old, hunky, clunky RV. And what's the funny thing is when you drive around Napa, in a like a 1978 RV, you look a little weird because Napa is a very wealthy area. And so when you're driving around in this RV, not to mention that we would pack this RV with like 15 kids. These kids are crazy. Like we're driving down the road and they're like screaming like, ah! like throwing spoons out the window and people are looking up like, what is going on? Kidnapping like a small class or something. <laughs> And what we would do is we would, we would pick up these kids from all around Napa area and we would take them to the park and we'd have church with them. And it was at Kids Reach that I met my friend named Brendan. And Brendan was such a funny kid. He was this little seven-year-old boy and he had this really low raspy voice because he smoked cigarettes. Like he was addicted to cigarettes. And so we play this game with Brendan. <laughs> See, who's the first one to steal Brendan's pack of cigarettes? <laughs> We'd sneak up behind him and grab him. He'd be like, hey, give those back. <laughs> <laughs> and Brendan was like my favorite kid. Brendan's the one that you know, I just really connected with when we there at Kids Reach. Every time we would just, we'd just meet and we fellowship together. And we'd go down to this pond and we would skip rocks together. And Brendan would always ask me, how is it, to, what is it like to be in college? What is it like to, 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 to what are you going to do after college? And I finally realized that I was the first person that Brendan ever knew that made it past high school. Much like every other kid at Kids Reach, Brendan was so poor. And every family member that he knew had abandoned him, had left him, was either in a gang or in jail or dead. And so he'd always ask me about my family. And finally, I'm like, Brendan, tell me a bit about your family. Like, I want to know about you, dude. And he said, well, the only family that I've known left. And I've just bounced around from foster home to foster home to foster home. And then he said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, well, I do have one family member, and that's my uncle. And about a year ago, my uncle raped me while my younger brother hid in the closet. I can't describe to you the kind of feelings that came up within me. So I'm thinking about Brendan. I'm thinking about what he went through. I'm thinking about the pain that he dealt with at seven years old. And then he said something to me. He looked up at me with tears in his eyes. He said, but I love my uncle. And I've forgiven him. I have never seen the heart of Jesus so clearly than in a seven-year-old boy who smokes cigarettes. I have forgiven him. Church family, the forgiven forgive. Not so that they are forgiven, but because we have been forgiven by a divine Savior, by Jesus who hung on a cross and he yelled out before his last breath, Father, 
forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And perhaps some of you this morning have been trying to handle your own, your own hurt and your own pain. Jesus gave us the answer. Jesus gave his forgiveness to who? The Father. He said, Father, take this. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. You're forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven so that you can forgive. And so this morning, there are note cards on the pews. Perhaps some of you have them already. What we want to do is we want to invite you this morning to write down a hurt, a pain, maybe something you haven't told anybody. And we want to let you know we're going to keep these cards completely confidential. We want, to, we, want you, we want to invite you to write down maybe a person that you need to forgive, a pain you need to forgive. And on the back, there's a space to write your name and your number and your email. You don't have to do any of those. You don't have to do any of those. But if you want to, our sanctuary lead team is going to be praying over all of these cards in the next couple weeks. We're going to be praying over helping, have God helping you to forgive. And if you want to put your number down, if you want to put your email down, we will personally send you a Bible verse encouraging you in your journey of forgiveness. Because church family, forgiveness is not a one-time event, but it's an ongoing evolution. As Jesus paints this picture of forgiveness in Matthew 18, he says it's not about keeping track, but it's about forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. There's no limit. So I'm going to pray. The band's going to come back up. We're going to sing a couple more songs, and we're going to invite you to write down a hurt, write down a pain. And if you would like to, write your name and number and email on the back, and we will pray over these cards because we want you to find freedom. We want you to find peace. We want you to find forgiveness. So church family, let's pray. God, this morning, some of us hold hurt in our heart that we haven't shared with anybody. A pain, God, that we have been trying to overcome when the true victory is through you. God, this morning we want to first off accept your forgiveness for our sins. Cleanse us, Jesus. Wipe our slate clean us to know that there, there is nothing that we could have done to pay the debt that we owe you, God. And God, because we are forgiven, may we forgive, and may we forgive, and forgive, and forgive, Jesus. This hurt, this pain, some things in this room are so big, so large, but God, I pray that you let them know that the larger the hurt, the larger the pain, the more you will send your spirit to give them strength. continue to lift your name high. Jesus, may we forgive. May we let go. God, we want to find life. Help us in this journey. We pray this in your holy and resurrected name. And everybody said,